Over 700 years ago, a cry from the east made the Romans and other European kings tremble in their thrones. All of a sudden, like a terrible flash of lightning, small Mongolian horses and their terrifying riders strike fear into the hearts of the citizens of Europe. What's even scarier for the Europeans is the fact that they know nothing of this grassland tribe. In 1245 AD, the Italian friar Giovanni da Pien del Carbine sets off from Lyon to Mongolia. He is under a mission from the Romans to persuade the Mongolians to lay down their weapons. He even hopes to convert them into Christians. 220 kilometers west of today's Ulaanbaatar in Karakoram, Carbine finally sees the Mongol Empire for the first time. They live in round tents propped up by stakes and poles. Their emperor, heads of state and other officials are all extremely wealthy. They possess a lot of gold, silver, silk and other precious stones. All of them from young to old are excellent archers. These missives help the West to unlock a mysterious world a Far East to which access was denied for centuries by the Khitans. They attack with sharp weapons and arrows, battling day and night without rest. There is a man named Genghis Khan. He calls himself the bravest hunter before God. Although Genghis Khan was already dead by then, his grandson would not pay his respects to the Pope either. Carbini left having achieved nothing. He could not stem the Mongols from their crazy desire to conquer the world. Many years later, the Mongolians would bear west to conquer Persia. The sound of their horses' hooves would ring the call of victory. As the Mongolians brought a fifth of the world under the shadow of their curved knife, the Mongol Empire expanded to the Pacific Ocean to the east, the coast of the Black Sea to the west, Lake Baikal to the north, and the South China Sea to the south. In 1271 AD, the Mongolians turned Beijing into the capital of the Mongol Empire, renaming it Kanbalik. The ruler was Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan. The Yan Dynasty did not last long in China's history. 
but his hundred-year rule injected a sense of ambition and development into the land. An era of violence and slaughter, this dynasty nevertheless brought the four great inventions of ancient China to the West, spreading the culture of the Orient to the West. And the Western calendar and the study of astronomy in the West began to influence central China. It was a time of strength and speed, a short-lived dynasty that left behind many riddles and mysteries, one of which is the revival of a 600-year-old tradition, which is delicate and elegant. Chinese porcelain has so perfect, and it was so popular all over Asia that it had a dominant, particularly in blue and white. It is, if you like, the luxury of ordinary people across the world. The Shanghai Museum is displaying artifacts from Turkey, Iran, America, England, and China. It brings together 90 beautiful pieces of blue and white porcelain scattered around the world all of which were made during the Yuan Dynasty. There were many different kinds of porcelain made in ancient China, and kilns were found all over the country. But the most famous and widespread of which is the blue and white porcelain ware. Why was this porcelain with simple blue patterns on its white body so popular and influential? Especially those that were made during the Yuan Dynasty, the veracity of these wares were only acknowledged a little over 60 years ago. Most people viewed the Yuan Dynasty as an era of conquest and speed. It was nothing compared to the art and culture of the Song Dynasty. Yet how could such a delicate art form be born from this period? In the height of summer, ships pass to and fro on the Grand Canal. Yangzhou has changed a lot since ancient times. Back then it was a vibrant port. An elegant and ancient arch hints at its past splendor. In 1275 AD, another Italian comes to China in the footsteps of Carbine. This time, he stays in China for 17 years and even becomes an official in Yangzhou for three years. This man is Marco Polo. The China he saw must have been decadent and Yuan music must have filled the air. 20 years later, the travels of Marco Polo became a household name and a huge success in the West captivating its readers with a mythical China. The Khan has constructed a palace with marble and other beautiful stones. Every room in this palace is paved with gold and decorated with lavish ornaments. His wine cup and wine bottle are all made from beautiful gold-plated metals. The Khan has so many metal objects that it's almost incredulous. The strange thing about the travels is that it does not mention any porcelain ware in the palace. Some even question if Marco Polo even came to China. However, the former Yuan official Su Tianjie also wrote that the emperor's wine wares were all made from gold-plated metal. Was porcelain not popular during the Yuan dynasty? The sky is wide above the grasslands. The people who live here are open and generous. In the grasslands of Xilingol, the first rays of the sun are just hitting the land. Monconason's family is about to begin their breakfast. <laughs> Uh, 
They don't use a lot of porcelain in their household. They only have some porcelain plates and bowls. Porcelain doesn't seem to be very practical for a nomadic lifestyle. We have about 30 horses, 40 to 50 cows, and about 100 sheep. The shepherds here move from grassland to grassland so that their livestock has fresh grass to feed on. Porcelain wares are heavy and brittle. They become a liability when moving from place to place. When their ancestors were conquering the Eurasian steppes, they were probably more fixated with large gestures and passions. The muted beauty of a delicate piece of porcelain ware was probably lost on their minds. The lower classes will always imitate the ways of the upper classes. Porcelain ware was so popular during the Song Dynasty because the royal family was in love with it. But to the hawkish and bellicose Mongol conquerors, the songs must have seemed too effeminate, decadent and impractical. The wealthy Song dynasty managed to resist the Khitans, the Jurchens, and the Tanguts over three centuries, but it was ultimately destroyed by the Yuan dynasty. How does culture continue through social upheavals? Where could porcelain go from there? Everyone knew at the time that all the achievements in porcelain during the Song dynasty would be lost forever, buried by the conquering hooves of the Mongol Empire. But in the Museum of Oriental Ceramics in Osaka, there is a national treasure mysteriously housed in a Japanese wooden box. It is a Yuhu Chun vase from the Longchuan Kiln in China. More miraculously, it wasn't produced during the Song era, but during the Warring Era of the Yuan Dynasty. Perhaps contrary to what everyone has assumed, the Mongols didn't completely wipe out porcelain production. It is late autumn in the Golden Lotus Prairie. All the flowers have fallen, yet the prairie is still lush. This is Xanadu, the summer capital of the Yuan Dynasty. Once prosperous and lively, it has been designated as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. We can still hear fragments of whispers from its lonely ruins echoing across the plains. It was here in May of 1260 AD that Kublai Khan became the Khan of the Mongol Empire. Soon after, he designated Beijing as the capital of the empire. This place used to be crucial to the happenings on the Eurasian steppes. But after the ravages of time, there is little left of the Yuan Empire. The tall walls and majestic courtyards are long gone, along with the sounds of horses and troops.
Yes, it's still there. This is good. The horse's name. In a workshop in the city of Hohat, Li Da Long is giving a class on sculpture. This was his main profession, but now it has become a hobby for him. His main profession now is pottery. I found it amazing that you could take a piece of clay, mold it into some shape, and then just throw it into the kiln. And when it comes out, all of a sudden it's become this beautiful thing. South of Hohat, along the border of Qingshuihe County, there are ten porcelain kilns along the hill. This was once a famous porcelain manufacturing place 30 years ago. It was here that Li Dalong studied under local celebrity potter Zhang Xuan. This place was famous for its Tu Qinghua style. It was very popular during the Yuan dynasty. Now it's hard to find. Fortunes change along with the times. These once busy kilns have fallen to neglect. But Li Dalong and Zhang Xuan refuse to give up. Reading the historical records, however, one finds surprises. 500 years ago, this was one of the biggest kilns north of the Great Wall. It started its life during the Song and Yuan eras, making pottery for common people. If one could trace the true origins of the Yuan blue and white porcelain, one might be able to refute the claim that porcelain fell out of favor during the Yuan dynasty. While people were still puzzling over the Yuan blue and white ware enigma, another ware named the egg white glazed ware suddenly emerged. Many of these wares have inscribed upon them the words Shu and Fu. What do they mean? Do they mean something specific? The answer, it turns out, wasn't too difficult to find. Shufu referred to a government department in the Yuan Empire. It literally meant central palace. The central palace was the most powerful military agency, even more important than the Ministry of Defense. The existence of these porcelain wares proved that the Yuan government had its own specially made porcelain ware. It did not completely reject Chinese culture. Instead, it treasured it and even placed it on the table of an important military agency. So, if the five great kilns were long gone by then, where did this Shufu ware come from? Is it like the wares from the Longchuan kiln? Is it just a relic of a previous dynasty? Longchuan to Jiang. Before they fire up the kiln, they will do a ritual to pray to the kiln god. After all, the entire family's livelihood depends on the quality of the wares that come out of the kiln. <laughs> Old man Jin doesn't talk much but the wrinkles on his face say a lot. He is the only one left in the village who uses wood as fuel in his kiln. Other kilns have long since switched to gas. In 2009, they were entered into the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage as traditional Longchuan Celadon making, the only ceramics title on the list. But Longchuan wares have historically been Celadon wares, not the white porcelain of the Shufu ware. Usually, imperial porcelain is made in dedicated official kilns and departments. But one name stands out in historical documents of the time, the Fuliang Porcelain Department. The name Fuliang doesn't ring a bell, 
but its location in Jingdezhen certainly does. Jingdezhen used to be located in the county of Fuyang. It became famous during the Jingde era of the Song Dynasty. Although Jingdezhen has long been known for its pottery, it never managed to crack the five great kilns of the time. Walking through the modern streets in the dark alleys of Jingdezhen today, one sees the influence of ceramics everywhere. There are master potters everywhere in this city. The road, paved by ceramic fragments, must have been built on many marvelous stories long buried by time. Ever since porcelain was invented in China during the Han Dynasty, this city has been part of its development. One wonders if it was porcelain that created Jingdezhen or Jingdezhen that created porcelain. At the end of the alley, Master Chen is making spare porcelain parts to survive. Now retired, he used to work in the National Red Flag Porcelain Factory 40 years ago. He has since been relegated to the sidelines of a commercialized porcelain industry. Everyone here used to work for the Red Flag Factory. Everything was handmade at the time. Now most of the wares were made by machines. The porcelain wares are now manufactured in an assembly line fashion in order to be mass produced. Whether it is a delicate decorative piece or a simple piece intended for daily use, its production at every step of the way is influenced by technology. Although handmade products sell better, machines have become irreplaceable in their production. The porcelain capital is still busy as usual. The origins of Jingdezhen's fantastic 700-year history as China's porcelain capital lie in the Yuan era. In 1278 AD, the anti-Yuan general Wen Tianxiang was captured. This was the time when the Southern Song Dynasty was desperately holding on to its last breath. During this time, the Yuan Empire had already set up its porcelain department in Fuliang County. This was the only agency set up to handle imperial porcelain production at the time. But why would the rough-and-tumble Mongolians fall in love with porcelain? There's no way of knowing what Kublai Khan was thinking at the time. There is no evidence to suggest that he had a passion for porcelain. All this is only conjecture people have posited after his death. Firstly, War requires money, and the porcelain trade was the most profitable one at the time. Secondly, when Kublai Khan took control over China, he insisted on following the laws of the Han people and respecting the Confucian ideals of the nation. The blue sky and the wide green expanse are the lifeblood of the Mongolian people. Perhaps it was the white of the clouds and the white of the sheep that made the Mongolians fall in love with the color white. The same color white that was found on the blue and white porcelain made in Jingdezhen. Perhaps that is also the reason why potters were spared by the Mongolians in the incursions. They were a nomadic people. They didn't have a handicraft to call their own. So maybe that's why they protected the potters out of economic necessity. When the Mongolians overturned the Song Dynasty, many were killed in the wars. But the potters and artisans were carefully spared. According to historical records, when the Mongolians conquered the Jin Empire, they garnered 720,000 artisans. When they conquered the Southern Song Empire, they garnered another 420,000. When the Northern Song kilns were abandoned for the Southern Song kilns, Jingdezhen suddenly received an influx of artisans.
But right before the porcelain department was about to start production, it ran into an embarrassing problem. It lacked quality clay due to overmining. There was no clay left to make porcelain. The talented potters could do nothing about it. The tiny little town of Yaoli, north of Jingdezhen, is an unmissable sight. Although it is a little remote, it has been producing quality porcelain since the Tang Dynasty. It often feels like a little paradise hidden away from the modern world. I'm gathering some wood to make dinner. We use Yaoli wood for the fire in the kiln, and the fire to make food at home. Master Wu used to work in a kiln when he was young. Now, only a few objects at home remind him of his previous occupation. He is now involved in an opera troupe in nearby Yao Li. One finds porcelain everywhere one turns in the Jingdezhen area. Porcelain is not just an object to the people here. It is their lifeline, the soil in which they grow. Master Wu used to go to work not far from Yao Li, in a village named Gao Ling. Other than its spectacular scenery, this place doesn't seem special. Yet, its quarries and white hills are what make this place famous all around the world. There is one thing that can be found here. They contain the legendary clay mineral, kaolinite. At the beginning of the Yuan Dynasty, when the clay supply for porcelain was dwindling in Jingdezhen, someone discovered this white clay. Someone must have decided to try it out, and its results were stunning. Compared to regular clay, it is much whiter, smoother, and firmer. This allowed potters to make bigger wares possible. This discovery has become a milestone in porcelain history. The new material has come to be known worldwide as kaolinite. Its discovery has not only rejuvenated Jingdezhen, it has also completely changed the history of porcelain making. Soon after, potters in Jingdezhen started to mix kaolinite with traditional clay, creating a new blend. This new blend creates a stronger piece of porcelain with a white color that is close to that of a duck's egg, the egg white glaze. Finally, the porcelain department of Fuliang can proudly stamp the two words Shufu on the wares they produce. The Yuan Dynasty now has a porcelain ware to call its own. But this is only the beginning. The famous blue and white ware is still yet to be born. In 1929, an overseas Chinese antique collector, Wu Benxi, came to Beijing's Liu Liqiang to sell a pair of blue and white porcelain vases. When the antique expert saw the words on the vases, he immediately decided that they were copies. The words were, in the fourth month of the 11th year of Ji Jiang. Ji Jiang refers to Tokon Timur, the Yuan Emperor, in whose reign the vases were made, 
but experts everywhere agreed at the time that no blue and white porcelain had been made during the Yuan Dynasty. And so a disappointed Wu Benqi took these copies back to England. There, he finally managed to sell them to a sharp Englishman named Sir Percival David. Twenty years later, an American scholar compared the vases to the Chinese blue and white porcelain found in Turkey and Iran and declared that these vases were indeed made in the Yuan dynasty. Because of this, this pair of vases has become known as the David vases and is acknowledged to be the standard bearer in Yuan blue and white porcelain. But Yuan blue and white ware did not come from nowhere. It must have had its very own genealogy. And so it goes. When the new rulers of the Yuan dynasty were celebrating their success, the Song pioneers of porcelain were fleeing from them and running for their lives. Throughout the millennia of Chinese history, every major shift in civilization and every dynasty change was accompanied by suffering, pain, and destruction. The relics of the previous dynasty, no matter how exquisite and delicate they might be, would be sacrificed for the coming of the new dynasty. It was that way when the Yuan took over the Song dynasty, and it would be that way too when the Ming took over the Yuan dynasty. Even though the glory of the Yuan blue and white porcelain could not prevent its own eventual downfall. The museum that houses the most Yuan blue and white porcelain ware in China is the Gao An City Museum in Jiangxi. But even that collection consists of only 19 wares. They were all discovered 30 years ago. They prove that the Yuan blue and white porcelain was also produced in Jingdezhen. The Ardabil Shrine in Iran houses 32 pieces of blue and white ware, while the biggest collection of blue and white ware lies in Turkey's Topkapi Palace, where more than 40 blue and white wares are housed. Incidentally, both Iran and Turkey are Muslim countries. Maybe this has something to do with Islam's reverence for the color blue. Turkey's capital, Istanbul, sits at the crossroads of Asia and Europe. This is where East and West meet. The tall dome and the ceilings of the Sultan Ahmed Mosque are adorned with blue tiles. In fact, there are so many blue tiles that it is popularly known as the Blue Mosque. These blue and white tiles are similar to the blue and white wares of the Yuan dynasty. The only difference is that they are made of clay, while the wares are porcelain. Perhaps the Turks had not mastered the art of making porcelain, but this just shows how popular blue and white wares were in the Muslim world, just as Chinese silk was popular among the Romans. Perhaps the Yuan blue and white wares were manufactured specifically for the foreign market. If that is so, it definitely makes sense that the Yuan Empire set up the porcelain department of Fuliang so hastily in Jingdezhen. Since the Tang Dynasty, the Arab world has been one of China's most important trade partners, and Chinese ceramics have been one of the country's biggest exports. When he arrived in China, he would want to give instructions to the kiln in central China, so not on the coast in the port where he arrived, but in central China, to say, can you make wares like this? I want things that look this way, my market, my, my customers, like this kind of thing. Professor Walter Oliver Neal has been doing research on Islamic pottery. But under his father's influence, he has also become interested in Chinese ceramics. 
the kilns in central China or southern China would, would make these and they would come back to. So the kind of connection and communications which were there in the early medieval period are already very, very impressive. On the Arab ship that became the Batu Itam shipwreck, there were three blue and white wares from the Tang dynasty. Islam had just been founded 200 years before. Although these wares cannot prove a direct relationship with the blue and white wares of the Yan dynasty, they at least provide evidence that they were marketable outside of China. The one development that the Yuan blue and white wares made over that of those of the Tang dynasty is this size. This might be due to the collective dining practices of Islam. The discovery of kaolinite allowed the mass production of much larger pieces of porcelain. In Islamic countries, people have traditionally their own traditions of sharing a meal. So you put a big, big dish in the middle of the table and every, everybody just takes from it. With demand comes development. To the potters in Jingdezhang, this was only natural. All they had to do was add an underglaze of blue patterns over the egg white body and that created the beautiful blue and white porcelain ware. All they needed was a touch of cobalt blue. If the blue in Tang San Tai came from Western Asia, where did the blue cobalt in Yan blue and white porcelain come from? In today's Jingdezhen, there are many stores, such as Zhang Jian's store here, that sell the materials for glazing. Blue cobalt is no longer hard to find. The blue and the young blue and white wares originally came from Iran. We call it small in the industry. It was one of the first things that came to China because of our trade with Persians. Seven hundred years ago, the era of the blue and white wear finally arrived. There are only three pieces like this sacrificial blue glazed porcelain plum blossom vase in the Yangzhou Museum. The vase depicts a magnificent dragon spreading his claws across a blue sky. It is glazed with a bluish-white tint, presenting a fantastic contrast. Blue, in this case, is not just the color of a glaze, it is a religion. The speed at which it spread rivals even the hooves of Genghis Khan's army. His shamanist and Buddhist descendants established four separate khanates in Central and West Asia. But ultimately, they all decided to go back to their own religion. The Mongolian conqueror's attitude was simple. They used whatever religion they could for their own ends. The biggest mosque in Qinghai, the Dongguan Mosque, Every Friday, believers from all over rush here to perform their prayers. There is a special ethnic group that comes, the Tomao people. Apparently, these people are descended from the Mongolians who came down to conquer China. They have since decided to settle down in the northeast of Qinghai. There are 60 families of them. They are all devout Muslims.
It is because of them that the color blue, the color that once shocked the royalty of the Tang dynasty, has finally come back to China. Besides the blue and white ware, Jing De Zhen also produced another famous type of glaze, the red underglaze. Its influence was not as far-reaching as that of the blue and white ware, and so little of it exists today. But by the middle and the end of the Yuan dynasty, Chinese ceramics had gone through yet another renaissance. Thirty years after Kublai Khan ascended to the throne, a system of yam was set up with over 10,000 relay stations, opening up more space for the porcelain trade. He set up these relay stations mainly to consolidate his power. But now that the empire had this communication system, everyone, including the common folk and the merchants, made use of it. Shanadu was the second capital of the Yuan dynasty. Thanks to the Yam system, it was connected to the rest of Europe and Asia. To encourage trade, the empire chose not to tax merchants who were coming through. This special tax-free status created a new profession in the merchant classes, that of a transporter of goods. Masi Bilik has always been close to the family of Meng Kenison. Every time he comes by, he never forgets to give Meng Kenison's daughter a present. Masi Bilik transports goods to the little stores in this area. He loves his job. He is like the transporter of goods in the Yuan dynasty. He pays careful attention to the shepherd's requests and exports local produce abroad at the same time. The Yuan dynasty continued to develop the maritime trade routes that were established in the previous dynasty. It's hard to imagine how the transport routes that were established on horseback could complement the shipping routes that were established on sea. But Kublai Khan had organized fleets of a few thousand ships once before. He was especially welcoming to foreign ships who had different wants and different needs. According to Wang Daoyuan, a maritime expert at the time, there were 6,200 merchants on the coast at any one time twice the number of soldiers on duty. Because of that, instead of diminishing, the powers of the maritime authority expanded. In the year 1289 alone, the maritime authority collected a tax payment of 200 kilograms of pearls and 160 kilograms of gold. Of this amount, most of the tax came from porcelain ware. Blue and white wares depart from Changjiang and Jingdezhang to the Gan River, through Poyang Lake and the Yangtze, down the coastal areas where they are gathered along with other porcelain wares. They then set off to sea, heading towards the various lands in Asia and the coastal areas of East Africa. For its 60th anniversary, the Shanghai Museum organized an exhibition of Yuan Dynasty blue and white porcelain. It was the first time many of these artifacts were shown at home. A visitor remarked that it might be centuries before all the Yuan blue and white wares can be gathered together like this again. The elegant Yuan blue and white ware 
introduced pictorial designs onto Chinese ceramics. Ceramics were no longer plain wares. They had become markers of culture and civilization. They were now imbued with elegance and spirit. That is how civilization is born, through a series of coincidences and chance opportunities. The Yuan blue and white ware stands as a symbol of the multiculturalism that was present in its time. The beautiful and precious blue patterns on the creamy white body traces the fleeting and short-lived emotions of the Yuan dynasty. As the Yuan dynasty came to an end, the legend of Jing De Zheng still endures. Their radiant blue and white wares still elicit wide-eyed wonder to this day. we will look for the vanished East India Company in Amsterdam. The blue and white porcelain inspires the Dutch to sail east. Neither massive storm at sea nor small squall can stop their passion for porcelain. This is the fifth episode of Porcelain Story, Looking to the Sea.